The EU is proposing sweeping action, taxes on some imports, a ban on selling cars with combustion engines and a huge push towards renewable energy over the next decade. All of that will need support from the continent's big industrial companies. The Italian energy group Enel is aiming for complete decarbonisation by the year 2050. Francesco Storacci is the CEO of Enel and he joins us now from Rome. Francesco, fantastic to have you on the show. Do you agree with the Commission President's assessment and do you think as far as the corporate community, the business community is concerned, they agree with her assessment and are ready for investing for change? I think there is a wide agreement on the fact that we are witnessing more frequent and more grave uh, events on the climate front and that this, this is a consequence of what's going on on uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, as a function of uh, human activity. And I think that is now widely shared among uh, most of the companies around the world, not only in Europe. So yes, I think she has made a statement that most people would stand by. You know, I think uh, if I look at your company alone, I mean, you've been talking, we have been talking together about ramping up investment in renewables now for years. I know you plan to cut carbon emissions by 80% by 2030, never mind full by, by 2050. But when I look at the, the green plan that e the EU announced, um, there are many challenges I can see. In, in particular, how do you get 27 nations to decarbonize, but at the same time meet the evolving demand needs without changing fundamentally changing regulations on things like something as basic as permits, for example. Regulations don't keep up with the ambition. I agree with you. I think uh, we do have an ambition that is widely shared and, and with the funds made available now, we do have also the money and the funds to, to carry out that effort. So we have the ambition, we have the money. What we do not have is uh, governance that at a is at par with this ambition uh, on permitting and on basically uh, allowing this investment flow to happen in a, in a shorter time frame. I think most countries will have to overhaul deeply the permitting uh, processes in order for this to happen. Otherwise, there would be frustration and most of these efforts will be wasted. So I think uh, it's now time to look at what rules need to be changed, what kind of permitting need to be streamlined uh, is possible. It doesn't require money, it doesn't require uh, a lot of work, but it requires some heavy involvement of governments into redesigning processes that are no more fit for this urgency and this ambition. How much and most back? states know it. Yeah, I was going to say, just because we know what we've got to do doesn't necessarily mean we achieve it or, or do it. How no. much pushback do you expect from, particularly from some of the less wealthy nations? I mean, the transition also has costs to cleaner energy. It has people, labour costs too, if you're not retraining people. Well, I think there is going to be pushback from different nations and also within nations between, between different industrial sectors. So there's a pushback on two dimensions at least and which is normal in all kinds of transitions when they accelerate. Uh, however, I think we have an opportunity here because the amount of money made available under, the, uh, under this effort, and in particular when the Fit for 55 package under the umbrella of Social Climate Fund is a staggering amount that I think would be able to smoothen and, and work around most of this uh, understandable pushback. I, I'm not, I, I'm just thinking that it's normal that people resist when they don't see this full picture. And I think this will happen here and there, but um, resources are being made available under this commission package. And I think it's a very wise move. Yeah, money's not one of the problems here. Um, the International Energy Agency came out a couple of weeks ago and I spoke to the chief and their report on what needs to happen in order to get to net zero by 2050 was, eye-opening, for want of a better word. They said that all fossil fuel investment needs to stop today in order to achieve that target. Do you agree with that? I think they are right, yes. And I think this report from the IEA is a milestone that will probably be remembered for decades in, in, the, in the timely manner in which this was put forward and also in the clarity with what uh, the argumentation has been uh, 
put forward to everyone. So I think it's a very, very important document that uh, is a watershed document before and after that report of the IA is a little bit the, the changing times for, uh, for investment climate around the world and also for climate change. Do you think in the interim, particularly in the period of transition, consumers will have to pay a higher cost for energy? And that's also something that we have to accept. Not necessarily, not necessarily. I think this is a little bit of a misperception. I don't think that the energy cost will go up. Actually, I think they will stabilize over the, the medium term and then go down. Uh, we are used to fluctuating energy commodity prices. That will should uh, clearly go away as we detach ourselves from fossil fuels. And zero marginal cost energy in, in, intrinsically drives down wholesale energy prices and therefore retail energy prices on the, on the long term. So I don't think it is likely to happen on the short term, medium term, and eventually on the long term. It's actually going to be the opposite. That's such a powerful message. If we can clean, clean energy up and we can provide it at lower costs. I mean, hallelujah. Francesco yeah. Storacci, I hope you're right, sir. Great to chat to you as always. The CEO of Enel there. Thank you.